Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the press conference at the end of the 40th meeting of the Conference of Heads of Government of the Caribbean Community. To bring the world up to date on what was discussed over the last two days, we have with us the Chairman of Conference, the Honorable Alan Chastenay, Prime Minister of St. Lucia, the Honorable Mia Motley, the Prime Minister of Barbados, and His Excellency Irvin LaRocque, Secretary General of the Caribbean Community. The press conference will be opened with a statement by the Chairman, Prime Minister Chastenay. Thank you very much. Um, it has been a most productive meeting with uh, free-flowing and frank discussions on a range of matters which were uh, before us. As to be expected, issues related to the CARICOM single market economy were aired and we urge that as a matter of priority, member states undertake the necessary action at the national level to complete the measures outlined in the implementation plan. We acknowledge the importance of timely reporting on our implementation actions and the challenges. There is no doubt that as well, we must enhance our efforts at public education and outreach. We had a good engagement with representatives of the private sector labor, and civil society. The private sector has made progress towards establishing the CARICOM private sector organization to enact formally with the heads of government and to be de designated as the associate institute of the community. This is expected to be finalized by the end of this year. Its specific purpose would to support, would, would to support fully the implementation of the CSME. We've agreed to designate the Caribbean Congress of Labour, the CCCL, as an associate institute of the community and welcome its commitment to engage with the CSPO on the mechanism for its participation in that grouping. A matter of concern to the heads of government is the continued blacklisting of some of the member states and associate members, which is clear and direct threat to the economic well-being of those countries and, in particular, the region. We agreed to refine the CARICOM strategy on blacklisting. With respect to Haiti, we agreed that a delegation of heads of government would visit the, the country to inform ourselves of the situation in that country. In our discussions on Venezuela, we reiterated the importance of resolving the crisis peacefully through, peacefully through dialogues between the both parties. We also agreed that the mediation-related activities would be continued to be continued, um, pursued by the Prime Ministers of St. Kitts and Nevis, Barbados and Trinidad and Tobago, as designated by the conference in the 30th session of the meeting. We expressed our support for the facilitation process being carried out by Norway with both sides of the dispute. We've, we had very fruitful interaction with the Prime Minister of Norway the Honorable Erna Solderberg, as we discuss issues of concern to the community, such as concessional financing to build resilience, climate change, the environment, and the sustainable ocean economy, in particular with respect to marine pollution. The Prime Minister indicated she appreciated our positions on the issues and supported them in large measure. The presence of the UN General Sec Secretary General, His Excellency Antonio Guterres, underlined the importance of the series of United Nations high-level events during the 74th session of the UN General Assembly from the 23rd to the 27th of September 2019. We felt that these high-level sessions presented an opportunity to advocate for several issues of interest to the member states, particularly climate change, financing for the development and sustainable development. Secretary General Guterres, as you heard in his statement at the opening ceremony, committed his organization to taking the steps it could to improve the access for small states to development financing as a priority. He also declared that eligibility for official development assistance should include vulnerability criteria, which is very much in sync with our own position. We also received a presentation by The Lodge, which is an organization facilitated and endorsed by the Duke of York. It's expected that we will be making a further presentation at the UNGA meeting in collaboration with 
the SIDS on a global basis. Let me end by saying that I am looking forward to the next six months as I work with my colleagues in the Secretary General to advance the interest of the community. Thank you, Prime Minister. I would invite Prime Minister Motley to make an opening statement. answer questions and to provide any support, but I'd like to just make one point. I think that this meeting will be historic if only for one reason, and it was the recognition by the Secretary General of the United Nations that the issue of vulnerability is a valid criterion to be considered with respect to the determination of official development assistance or other forms of financing for our countries within the region. Anyone who has been following the public affairs of small island states for the last few decades will know that whether it was with respect to the establishment of the World Trade Organization, when we argued the necessity for small, um, for special and differential treatment um, on the basis that we were not in any way contributing to distort global trade in goods or services, or whether it has been in our continued insistence, particularly in recent years with respect to the negative consequences of climatic change, that we literally have an inherent vulnerability as a small state that cannot be discounted. Um, it has been almost 20 years that we've been waging this battle and to have the formal recognition at the opening ceremony of this heads of government meeting was indeed a momentous occasion for us. And it is upon this that we have now to build and to ensure that the exclusion of access by many of our countries from official development assistance or concessional funding um, ought to be reconsidered given the fact that regardless of how well we may appear to be doing, within 48 to 72 hours, our entire existence can change in this region during the month of September. And I believe that that recognition, therefore, um, Prime Minister Shastani will come to be regarded at this point in time, at this 40th Heads of Government meeting here at Castries. There were a number of other significant achievements too that may not be as sexy, but a recognition that we have to work together, for example, to be able to fight the issue of the sargassum weed. We have to look at the science behind it. We have to see how best we can cooperate. And the presence of uh, the Honorable Ernest Solberg, Prime Minister of Norway, um, and the fact that Norway has been the leading voice on ocean governance, and on that Commission also sits the Prime Minister of Jamaica, the Honorable Andrew Holness, um, gives us comfort that we can work towards working with them and in particular the Association of Caribbean States, which has been the designated entity with respect to the other wider Caribbean states on the issue of many of these uh, matters pertaining to maritime affairs, but in particular on the sargassum that we can work in a collaborative way to see where the science is taking us, what is really causing it, to see how we can deal with the engineering that's necessary because the real issue comes from the rate at which the sargassum is coming on shore. And if we could treat it as a marine resource, just as you treat fish or minerals, it'd be no problem. But the difficulty comes once it comes on shore, the rate at which it comes on shore, and the toxicity and the noxious odors that flow from it. And I think you only have to look and see what's happening as far afield as Mexico and in Florida to understand that this is not an Eastern or Southern Caribbean issue. This is an entire issue affecting the region. The other major matter for me, which we've agreed to at this conference, is the recognition that in building out the single market and single economy, that we need to build capacity. And indeed, there had been a time when within the community we were sharing the resources among our chief parliamentary council, 
with respect to the drafting of legislation, acts and bills, um, that has fallen in to the sway truth. We've agreed that we need to work with our development partners to establish a regional law reform commission that will comprise of eminent legal brains to help us because legislation is at the core of governance. And if we can't prepare the policy and the legislation that's necessary to bring about the changes within the single market and the single economy, we're not going to see the level of progress that we um, ought to be seeing. And therefore, we are grateful also that the Premier of Cayman Islands has agreed that their own Law Reform Commission will work with CARICOM in the establishment of this Regional Law Reform Commission. The establishment of the CARICOM private sector organization is another major achievement. We believe that this is an absolutely essential component along with the existing Caribbean Congress of Labor to our being able to work cooperatively to make the difference with respect to the things that we can achieve at a regional level. If you recall in December um, in Port of Spain, we set out a framework for the medium term that we would want to see levels of production integration with respect to renewable energy, food security, air and maritime transport, and ICT um, technology. And therefore, the establishment of this regional private sector entity, the CARICOM private sector organization, is absolutely critical to our being able to work in a collaborative fashion to see movements on some of these factors. Um, and the last point that I'd like to make, and perhaps I should have done it earlier, um, 25 years ago within the heads of government of this region, the, the, the idea, or more than 25 years ago, the idea of an association of Caribbean states was given birth. And we would want formally to recognize the Association of Caribbean States 25th anniversary because we do believe that and we're seeing it now that we are bound by a Caribbean Sea that has to be regarded first and foremost as a zone of peace, but secondly, by a Caribbean Sea that is at risk of threatening our stability and our economic development with the onset of the Sargassum in recent times. And of course, we can go on to talk about the reefs and the warming of the oceans and the sea rise, but those two immediate things should be enough to tell you that we are bound by this sea irrespective of who colonized us or what language we speak. And to that extent, the Association of Caribbean States 25th anniversary is something that we would want to appropriately celebrate as well, given that its birth came out of this CARICOM heads of government institution some years ago. Thank you. Thank you, Prime Minister. We now invite your questions, but in asking your questions, could you please state your name and the media organization that you represent? Hi, good afternoon. Janika Simon from Choice TV in St. Lucia. Uh, Prime Ministers, thank you very much for your comments. I want to ask um, whether you can maybe elaborate a little bit more on your discussion specifically about timelines for action in terms of implementation, implementation of various um, uh, actions for the deepening of CSME. Um, I know that I saw him a while ago. Professor Hilary Beckles has lamented that we in the region suffer from what's called implementation deficit disorder. So maybe you can um, you know, give some comfort to your citizens by talking about specific actions and specific timelines that you're taking to deepen regional integration. Thank you. Thank you. Um the timelines are long, and I'd ask, when I say long, there's a long list of timelines, rather, and I'd ask the Secretariat to share them with you after, but the bottom line is that we have for us um, a number of things that will be happening. We hope, for example, by the next CARICOM intercessional meeting, which will be held in Bridgetown, 
in Barbados that we will put behind us a number of the key aspects of the financial architecture, a common financial services um, agreement, the work towards regional um, harmonization with the stock exchange, the credit rating um, bureau, the whole question of a common investment policy. Uh, similarly, there are some definitional issues that we're trying to sort out with respect to fisheries workers. Um, so we've separated fisheries workers from agricultural workers. This is the nitty gritty of execution to provide the level of certainty that will give our citizens the comfort that we want them to have. Um, of course, we have made significant progress in the last year with the establishment of the contingent rights, um, people being able to move with respect to um, their families and dependents and having the comfort that whether it's with their spouse and dependents, they can get certain rights as they move. The public procurement notice board that will allow businesses in different countries to be able to participate in procurement. Um, these are some of the things that we have done in the last year, and quite frankly, we've done a hell of a lot, but we also recognize that we need to, just on a few of the more complex issues, which is what a lot of the financial services type agreements are, that we need to be able to carry along all, each and every one of our jurisdictions. There are some concerns on drafting issues. Um, and it is important that, therefore, instead of rushing it for this year, we give ourselves till February next year with respect to that. Um, there are some other issues. The multilateral air services agreement was signed. We expect that to be fully operational shortly. So I think CARICOM can give you the list. There's about two pages of um, items and timelines, and that will help you in being able to share but I think that the, I don't want to call it an implementation deficit disorder anymore. I think that um, having diagnosed what it was that the medication is working, but as I say to my people in Barbados, we need to stay on course, stay the course. Uh, it would be remiss of me at this time um, not to, um, and I'm sure my colleagues would concur, um, but to reiterate the, some of the comments I made in my opening statements um, at the opening session, and that really is to recognize the, um, the incredible effort um, of Prime Minister Motley um, when it comes to CSME. Um, so the other good thing is I think that Prime Minister Motley has genuinely recognized some of the more difficult situations as it pertains to the MDCs and the LDCs. Um, and that we cannot move forward until that is resolved. And that people's silence sometimes cannot be taken as agreeing that we have a difficult situation in that we're not building an architecture anymore in anticipation of what is going to happen. We, in fact, have had several years of CSME. And so there are some of the elements that we already know and understand and now understanding them is how do we now include that in being able to move forward. Um, I felt at this meeting um, that there were several tense and intense discussions and that while some people might find these things offend, offending, I don't because it means we're now starting to get to the core of what the issue was. And what was incredibly satisfying was the renewal of the commitment by both the MDCs and the LDCs to work together, recognizing that both entities need to make sacrifices. LDCs have made significant sacrifices in opening their doors to competition of the MDCs. And the MDCs equally must also recognize those sacrifices and to know that their benefits that they have received could only be continued if, in fact, the LDCs continue to participate. So I don't want you to believe it's simply of dotting the I's and crossing the T's. There are some emotional issues that need to be resolved. And the fact is that while some people may not want to think that we sit here representing the citizens of our country, we do. And as the Prime Minister Gonzalez of St. Vincent continues to remind us, we are a community of sovereign and independent countries. 
And so continuously trying to get the unanimity that's required uh, to move forward is not easy. But I just want to really congratulate um, the Prime Minister that since she has now taken back the helm um, of the CSME and given her own experience um, with regards to World Cup and also many security matters, that we've seen a new energy and a new resolve. And, and I can say, I, I believe that all of us would agree that what is required from the leadership in the Caribbean today is humility. That we don't take any of the issues that are happening on a personal basis, but recognize we also have a right to, to represent um, our citizens. And, and, I, and I think that we made substantial progress um, in recognizing some of our deficiencies, recognizing that there were some people who were having difficulties in articulating properly what their concerns were, and now putting those concerns on the table and dealing with them, because that's the only way that we can move forward. So again, I want to congratulate her um, on the efforts that she's put forward and, and a lot of the success, um, while she cannot do it alone, but a lot of the success is really a, can be attributed directly to her um, intensity, involvement, and passion. Okay, well, in, in it, it, it would be remiss of me as well, and it's not a mutual admiration club, but it really isn't. But Prime Minister Chastney has gone out on a limb on the issue of this matter of access to financing for small, vulnerable states. And part and parcel of the achievement of having the UN Secretary General speak in the way in which he spoke at the opening of this meeting is really as a result of the consistent efforts of a lot of people. But Prime Minister Chastney has been one of those who has perhaps traveled more to engage more on these issues. And um, we don't expect that it is going to change overnight. And I want to constrain people's expectations but it is the beginning of a journey, we hope, to start to turn around the equation and to start to turn around the conversation with respect to what options are available to us as small island developing states. We have said repeatedly, we have not been at the front line of contributing to the war, to the, to the global warming, but we have been on the front line of the consequences of it and the notion that every September brings a level of anxiety in the Eastern and Southern Caribbean is something that cannot be ignored and the world does not appreciate it. He who feels it knows it. You have to live through it to know it and to understand it and we're beginning to get that message home to others and, and I want to thank him for that. And what is perhaps less said, we've also had the opportunity here in Castries to have a number of high-level encounters with um, counterparts in the region, U.S. Congresswoman from U.S. Stacey Virgin Plaskett. Islands, um, Stacey Plaskett. The chairperson of the uh, and Caribbean Caucus. She's chair of the Caribbean Caucus in Congress. And then with Mr. Arnold Donald from Carnival Corporation who is the CEO um, of Carnival Corporation. And as you know, most of our islands in the Eastern and Southern Caribbean depend um, in some measure or another on cruise tourism. And I think being able to bring those persons here for that encounter along with the UN Secretary General and along with the Prime Minister of Norway has made these last two days very rewarding at many levels. Um, history does not happen in a straight line all the time. But what is important is that we take account and claim ground wherever we can and move to the next level. And I'm satisfied that this meeting made an appreciable difference to our continued path along making the CSME and this regional integration experiment a reality um, for the better for Caribbean people. The, other points that perhaps have not been highlighted on, and I will only say this, is that 
there is a recognition that we speak as a community of sovereign states with principle. And whether it is on Venezuela with respect to peaceful dialogue, or whether it is in understanding what is happening in Haiti through the establishment of a prime ministerial subcommittee that will have the chairman of CARICOM, Prime Minister Chastney, Prime Minister Minis from Bahamas, and Prime Minister Holness mm -hmm. from Jamaica, along with the Secretary General, to allow us to be able to be at the forefront of determining the factual matrix in Haiti, because we have no difficulty as a community with speaking truth to power, but we will always do so on the basis of an independent analysis of our own and based on our understanding and appreciation of the principles that have been enshrined both in the revised Treaty of Chagaramas but also in the Charter of Civil Society, which we continue to uphold. SJ, I don't know if you want to add to that. Thank you, Madam Prime Minister. I think um, we had uh, extensive discussions, as you've said, and we'll be planning this mission into Haiti very, very soon. Um, contrary to what others may have been saying, we have been in, in contact with Haiti uh, all along, and you'll have seen some statements that were issued by the immediate past president, president um, chairman. I also want to recognize, by the way, the, the, the work that was done by Prime Minister Timothy Harris in the past six months, very, very active period. On the um, issue of the advancement of the CSM, a number of legal instruments, well, integration, a number of legal instruments were signed by uh, member states. Um, I think we are very, very close to seeing the uh, multilateral air services agreement um, becoming operational, which would um, free up the skies in the, in the region. We, we had a number of um, signatures and um, some ratifications, so, and also our legal instruments. There was an extensive discussion as well, sorry, on our security instruments. Um, so we've made progress in those areas, um, and I think we need to recognize that. I cannot underscore the work that we've been doing internationally. I think very often CARICOM is judged solely on what you think you hear about the CSME and this word which I dislike, implementation deficit, mm -hmm. because it's a process. Our integration arrangement is a process. It's a constant moving forward, and you have to negotiate among the 15 member states to get things done. A lot of good technical work goes on behind it, and then we move forward as we go in. But our integration is much more than that. We are security uh, coordination, um, foreign policy coordination, so security cooperation, foreign policy coordination, and um, uh, uh, human social development. For instance, we, 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 we planned for um, preparations for the series of meetings at the UN General Assembly, uh, meetings on climate change, on financing for development, and on SIDS. And as all of that is part of our advocacy in terms of financing, the financing that both prime ministers have mentioned is so critical for us. The point has been made for so long that you need the funding for resilience, not after hurricane or after disaster, you need it before. And these things don't happen overnight. You have to keep advocating for it. And it's, it's a process. Everywhere you go, it's a process. In international community, it's a process. But we're making steady progress. And I think we, this was, in that regard, quite a successful um, 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 engagement. The engagement with, um, with the, our guests, the two guests, as well as um, with um, Congresswoman Stacey Plas Plaskett was a very, very in, in, um, important in terms of persons understanding more and more uh, the issues of the Car Caribbean community and of small states. The Secretary General of the Caribbean of the United Nations has come down to our region before. He's back again, which demonstrates a commitment and an interest in matters of small states. And in the private discussions held afterwards, that, was, that commitment was, was recommitted. So I think we have made progress on the, on the community front. We've made progress on the international front. And we have to keep plowing forward. There was one other matter, um, Mr. <coughs> Chairman, that we didn't raise. And we can perhaps share. Um, I think we made a significant de decision for the future through the establishment of an African, Brazilian, Caribbean diaspora commission. And it will be chaired by Prime Minister Gonzalez. And it's a recognition that we have common interests and that these common interests need now to be bridged in a way that reinforces the options for our society as well as for our economies. And um, to that extent, we want to have a strategic approach to it. 
and um, Prime Minister Gonzalez, the um, President of Suriname, and myself will serve on the committee, but it will be open-ended to all member states because this is something we expect to deliver for us. I've been speaking about our Atlantic destiny um, as a nation state. And the last point that I'd like to make is that I'd like to thank fellow member states of CARICOM for offering their support for Barbados in the hosting of um, the bid to host the quadrennial, the 15th quadrennial assembly of UNCTAD in October next year, October 2020. Um, Barbados will become along one of the smallest states ever to host this um, assembly of UNCTAD and we will be doing it jointly with the United Arab Emirates um, and will equally then in Dubai jointly host with them. We're bidding to do the World Investment Forum there so that we will have a joint approach to the UNCTAD General Assembly in Barbados and similarly to the World Investment Forum in Dubai. And it would be remiss of me for not thanking our colleague countries for the support that they're given us. The trade and development round of UNCTAD have recommended us, but the matter has now to go to the UN General Assembly in September. Um, I just want to maybe comment on uh, a couple of things. First of all, is also to acknowledge the, um, the meeting with uh, Congresswoman Stacey Plaskett, who is the chairperson of the Caribbean Caucus, but also the representative from the U.S. Virgin Islands. And this is significant because um, obviously those are two very instrumental representations for us. One, she's coming specifically from the Caribbean, um, and certainly uh, she's a Democrat. Um, so it means that we also have uh, uh, both parties that we have to be able to navigate through because they are White House policies and then they are Congress and senatorial um, uh, positions. And so therefore, uh, the continuing effort both on financial services as well as trade um, came up with the U.S. As part of that, um, I was very grateful for uh, my colleague's endorsement um, for us to continue the efforts to be able to establish a Florida Caribbean conference, um, which is due to take place in early December in Florida. Um, the governor of, of Florida, um, the senators of Florida, the congresspersons, both of the Democrats and Republicans, and also the mayor of Miami, um, have endorsed this, uh, this uh, conference. The, the expectation is, is that at a very high level that we can start integrating um, with the Florida politicians and assist us in our lobbying effort in Washington, D.C. And why Florida is because it's the state where we have the greatest amount of economic impact. In fact, um, almost 80 cents of every dollar that a U.S. tourist uh, spends in our region goes back to America. And so between the airlines, the cruise ships, the same natural disasters that are affecting us are also affecting Florida. The same issues and source of crime with regards to drug trafficking are coming um, in the same region. So there are a lot of synergies to be had by both groups in terms of working together. And I guess the last one, which is a very critical one, is the Caribbean's diaspora is significant in Florida. So not only um, are we able to, on an economic basis, but certainly in, from a policy in, uh, perspective and influencing a voting in the region, um, we will make sure that, that the diaspora is a significant part of the conference that we're going to be moving, um, moving forward to. And last but not least, I was very grateful, um, not only for the comments that uh, the UN General Secretary Guterres gave, but his endorsement of our idea of being able to create a SIDS Foundation for uh, Resilience. And uh, there was a presentation by um, a group called the um, uh, mm, the was it called the Legion? Lodge. The Lodge um, group, which is a group um, that is associated to the Duke of York um, that have put a proposal together to assist us in providing the governance structure and the mechanism to be able to get private sector funds to come in to assist us in our challenge with, SAT, uh, with the SIDS. And uh, I, I very much appreciate 
um, the support from my colleagues with the understanding that at a later date that we'll be making a presentation on the more on details in terms of how that would work but the expectation is that we're going to be making a, a wider presentation to the SIDS um, in September and if in fact they were able to obtain the final endorsement from both CARICOM and also the Pacific SIDS the intention would be to try to quickly move um, to meet with some of the uh, ODA countries and multilaterals in terms of getting funds into this thing. And I want to make the point that what we're looking to do is to seek is to get additional funds. This is not to tap into the funds that we currently have, but this is funds that we, we believe that this region is due as a result of what's taking place with um, the global warming and climate change. We, we cannot deal with this, handle the situation through um, mitigation. The SIDS collectively are only a half a percent of the emissions. Um, and if we are to have adaptation, um, it's impossible, and, then, and studies have proven that by the IMF, for us to use our current sources or to have borrow money directly to be able to fulfill our, uh, our needs in, from an adaptation perspective. Um, and certainly the idea of sagasm and also the rising sea levels are things that are not, we're not even included in the cost. So that's only going to make it that much more difficult for us to be able in moving forward. So uh, again, I, there were so many areas that were covered. And the last one that I have to say to you that I was very encouraged by um, was the presentation on security, um, in which there is a consensus in moving together with regards to a rapid response unit. Um, I believe we're waiting for the final costings of that. Um, that would be a, a regional rapid response unit. And also that we are very close, I believe, in getting um, a commitment on a funding formula to be able to enhance what we're doing currently at, um, at IMPACTS and also at the uh, uh, GRCC. So again, that's encouraging news because these are very important levels in terms of us uh, effectively executing our remit to our citizens. Um, good evening, Joshua Sentemi from the St. Lucia Star. Um, I was just wondering if there were any discussions on the citizenship by investment programs throughout the region? There wasn't any specific questions um, or discussions other than to note that the European group um, that currently are uh, the Code of Conduct group um, in Europe have, have, have indicated that they are going to be reviewing both the CIP programs and the residency programs and that we felt that we should not do um, uh, what happened to us with regards to harmful taxation and wait for it to happen but to anticipate it. So I think that um, there was an, uh, a proposal put forward to um, jointly sponsor um, a, a, a review of our options and our strategy moving forward and there were certainly agreements on a, a, a lobbying campaign both in the Europe and as well as the United States of America. So nothing specific to CIP, but other, other than recognizing that, that there is a potential danger um, in the horizon and that we should try to anticipate that. And concerning the sargassum, um, can you speak to, or either you or Prime Minister Motley, what exactly will the joint effort be in tackling that issue? As I said, we have to go where the science takes us. Part of the difficulty is, and um, the ACS I met with earlier today because they have just come out of the conference in Mexico. They are pulling together for us all of the scientific research. We need to see how we can build on that because you have to follow the science um, in these matters. And then on the engineering side, we need to have the engineering capacity to be able to deal with the rate of movement of the sargassum as it comes on shore because I'm sure you know when you go and smell it when it comes on shore it's completely different <coughs> from when it's floating in the sea. When it's floating in the sea it's like a film. When it comes on shore you're talking about meters, five, six, seven, eight meters of sargassum just on top of each other and um, the noxious smells are like rotten eggs. So um, we have to follow the science and we have to develop an engineering capacity. And what Sargassum is showing us is that it is no respecter of 
language, of sovereignty, of any of the other things that separate us at the moment. And we would do well to come together to try to resolve something that is causing us a great harm. And it's causing harm where it hurts the most is fishermen, okay. hoteliers. And, and it's really the small hoteliers because the larger ones may have the capacity to fight it on a daily basis. The average small hotel does not have the capacity to fight it on a daily basis. Um, the people who are craftsmen who depend on the volume of persons coming in to those tourism communities, the people who are cooking, um, who all of a sudden don't have anybody coming to them because the numbers are <coughs> dwindling because of the impact of it. So we know we can make soaps from it. We know we can make um, fertilizers. fertilizers from it. Or we, we need to be able to see how can we harvest it to be able to create sustainable economic enterprises out of it. Um, and this is where the cooperation comes together will make a difference to all of us. Are we going to solve it overnight? No, we're not. But we have to start and treat to it in as major a way as we've treated to the issue of global warming as a whole. Thank you. And seeing that there are no further questions, we'd like to thank you for it. Hold on, OK. What? There can't be many more. We'll have one more. On the candidacy of the OAS Secretary General, who is seeking a second term. No. Um, the question is whether the heads um, adopted a position with regards to the, um, the endorsement of the Secretary General of the OAS for a second term. That never came up. And um, uh, I think internally we've had discussions about that. And I think many of us have voiced um, our concerns, but that there no official position has been taken on that. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen of the media, and thank you to Chairman Chastanay, Prime Minister Motley, and the Secretary General, and I hope the message gets out far and wide. Good night.